Kirby has certainly had an interesting ride on the Nintendo Switch thus far. His first mainline game on the console, Kirby Star Allies, is according to Metacritic, the fourth worst mainline Kirby game of all time. Comparatively, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, his second entry on the console, is the second best reviewed Kirby game of all time, losing out only to Kirby Superstar Ultra, a game considered by many to be the magnum opus of the whole series. So what happened here exactly? How in the space of just four years did we go from one of the most disappointing Kirby games of all time to one of the best? Come along with me viewers as we analyze how one of these games played it safe, sticking closely to designs that had worked well in the past, while the other took some bold, fresh chances for the series. Oh, um, editor, it's uh, actually the other way around. Skeptical? Well then, come along and prepare to be convinced. Part 1. Lost on a Straight Road Just to set expectations for this video, I'll be drawing a lot of comparisons to the past when comparing these two games, specifically the recent past, what I consider to be the modern era of Kirby, which I say starts about with Kirby's return to Dreamland on the Wii, certainly encompasses the 3DS games Trip Deluxe and Planet Robobot, and of course, brings us to the present with Star Allies and the Forgotten Land. Now, as I alluded to in the introduction, it is my opinion that between the Forgotten Land and Star Allies, it's actually the Forgotten Land that more closely follows the design philosophy of modern Kirby. Specifically, it's level design philosophy, a philosophy I like to call linear exploration. Basically, it's the idea that those collectibles you can get in levels are not just some fun bonuses to get if you feel like it. No, they are necessary to obtain if you wish to further your progress. So basically, a game following the design philosophy of linear exploration, while having fairly linear levels, is not content with you just reaching the end of said levels. It demands instead that you take some detours and grab some sunstones or code cubes or, dare I say, waddle along the way, if you want to be able to advance further in the game. That's right, The Forgotten Land has basically the same level progression system as the 3DS Kirby games and in my opinion, it's made a better game for that fact. Some such reasons include, yes, things like replay value, but also the fact that such design invites players to engage more meaningfully with their environment, which is especially good for The Forgotten Land, because its environments are very nice. I mean, seriously, this mall is like one of the most realistic malls I've seen in a video game. It also provides variety to the gameplay, as well as allows the game to present players with levels that are relatively easy to beat, but which contain collectibles that are a bit harder to acquire. Requiring the player to obtain those collectibles gives them incentive to interact with those challenges. However, the fact that the game doesn't force you to get all of them gives a lower skill player the flexibility to pick and choose which collectibles they decide to pursue, thus avoiding getting stuck. Now, The Forgotten Land does add an interesting twist to the system, which I may actually like a bit better than its initial incarnations in Triple Deluxe and Planet Robobot. That twist is hiding the very nature of several of the objectives to get your collectibles on your initial playthrough of the level, which not only increases replay value, but also enables more varied objectives to exist, and encourages curiosity and exploration to an even greater extent. Star Allies, on the other hand, revolutionizes the formula by breaking with tradition and having... basically nothing of the sort. The closest thing it has to collectibles are these puzzle pieces. But there's literally no point in collecting them other than for the inherent purpose of collecting them. You compare that to Sunstones, Code Cubes, or Waddle Dees, which you must get a certain amount of from each world to advance, or heck, even the Energy Spheres from Return to Dreamland, which at least unlocked things like copy ability rooms, and it really takes the life out of the game when you realize that there's no point in any of it. You're left wondering if there's any point in taking any detours or doing any side content at all. You just end up rushing straight to the end of the level. Immediately, you start to see why Star Allies gameplay often feels so one note. In fact, lacking any meaningful collectibles isn't just bad for its own sake, it also sabotages the main draw, the main gimmick of Kirby games since Kirby's Adventure. Copy Abilities Part 2 I don't need super strength for my desk job. If there's one thing Kirby is known for, it's his signature ability to copy his enemies' abilities. I mean, if you really think about it, it's sort of just a cute way to dress up the actually very standard video game mechanic of power-ups. But hey, it works for Kirby, and no one does it quite as well as him, I must say. Now, Kirby's copy abilities are awesome. I love them. 
and certainly have my favorites. That being said, I think we can all agree that most of the fun of the system lies in the ability to swap between them on the fly, and in so doing vary your playstyles. There is after all a very big difference between playing as Rock compared to say, Sword or Fighter or take any number of copy abilities. And if you look at the Forgotten Land, it does a fabulous job of encouraging you to be swapping between its copy abilities with decent regularity. Due to the fact that you need to get Waddle Dees, which often require you to use a certain copy ability to be able to get them. It's just natural to swap to a different ability, grab your Waddle Dee, and then maybe say, Hey, while I've got the ability, I might as well give it a proper spin. And BOOM! You just injected your playthrough with some variety. You compare that with Star Allies, which has no optional goals that you're incentivized to pursue much at all, let alone ones that require you to switch out your copy ability, and there's really no reason for you not to just stick with the same copy ability the whole way through. As a point of reference, I have made videos on this channel attempting to beat seven different Kirby games without jumping, including both Star Allies and The Forgotten Land. And Star Allies is the only one of those seven where I use the same copy ability throughout the entire game. Quite simply, Star Allies copy abilities are made actively less interesting by the fact that you never actually find yourself needing to use them. Which kinda takes away the whole point, doesn't it? Frankly, while that's bad from a structural level, there may be even deeper issues in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Part 3. In the land of the bots, the human player is bored. Now thus far we've talked about design decisions that, well, not my cup of tea, are at the very least defensible. This part though, I don't know how you defend it. In fact, I'm so curious to see defenses of this decision that I'll heart any comment I see which sufficiently articulates a counterpoint to what I'm about to say. Kirby Star Allies is multiplayer focused to the point of ruining the single player experience. Because I'll be honest. Some of these combat encounters and boss fights actually seem pretty cool, and would probably be a blast to play if your AI companions would step aside and let you play the darn things. I'm sorry, but it's just not a very fun experience to just sort of stand around while your buddies do all of the work. Now I know what you're thinking. But Simicraft, you could just not have friends if you're such an antisocial loner. Ah uh, yes, but the thing is, commenter, you are wrong about that for you require friends to use these various friend gimmicks like friend circles, friend trains, etc. And therefore, friends you must acquire. But Simicraft, you could just unfriend them immediately thereafter! I mean, yes, technically one could do that, if you don't mind also losing your copy ability, since unfriending is mapped to the same button as throwing away your copy ability. And then of course you have to go through the same rigmarole next time a friend circle comes up. Which who knows when that would be, you know, it could be another hour from now, it could be like five minutes from now. Look, ultimately, yeah, I could do that, I could go through that process, but that's a thing I call work. Ultimately, I am not playing a Kirby game to manage HR. It comes down to a matter of design. It is a game designer's job to make the path of least resistance that most players will gravitate towards the optimal experience for having fun. If I have to go out of my way to fire my whole crew every few levels, if I have to hold myself intentionally to go out of my way to obtain collectibles which I have no in-game reason to get to be able to obtain that optimal fun experience, then that is a failure of design. Oh, speaking of which, on my most recent playthrough of Star Allies, I did actually hold myself to collecting those puzzle pieces as strictly as if they were something like Waddle Dees or Sunstones, as a sort of test of my theories. Which went... Interestingly, to say the least. Part 4. A Bachelor's Miniman Kirby in the Forgotten Land is a single-player game with a multiplayer mode. Kirby Star Allies is a multiplayer game with a single-player mode. Now both of those are valid ways to approach designing a game. I will say that for me, however, Kirby is a single-player experience, so I personally much favor the Forgotten Land's approach. That being said, I understand that each game makes trade-offs that harm the mode that is not their focus. In the interest of fairness, I will list the Forgotten Land's uh, trade-offs first. In the Forgotten Land, playing as Waddle Dee, you can sort of feel like a second-class citizen. You can't use copy abilities, influence the camera, or meaningfully interact with mouthful abilities. Quite frankly, it can feel a bit like you are the third wheel on a date between Kirby and the game itself. However, Star Allies' concessions seem greater to me. 
The level design itself has been altered significantly to accommodate for four players. The screen is more zoomed out, and level geometry tends to be less cramped than it gets in other Kirby games. That's actually quite relevant, because cramped level designs nerfed the utility of Kirby's ability to hover, which in turn serves to make level navigation more dangerous and interesting. Additionally, the puzzle rooms are quite underplayed, and as previously stated, much more optional. I presume this is so as not to slow the pacing of a multiplayer romp through the game. Which is a real shame, because some of the best parts of my recent playthrough of Star Allies was when I decided to go out of my way to play the puzzle rooms they did have. It would seem to you that the multiplayer focus of Star Allies tends to cause less interesting level designs, which obviously helps to make for a most underwhelming game. Part 5. Location, Location, Location I won't spend long on this point since it's so self-evident, but Star Allies' theme is just not as interesting as the Forgotten Lands. I mean, in theory, the spacefaring adventure at the end should be interesting, but quite frankly it's not, it's mostly just means going to palette swapped versions of levels we've already been to. Y you don't get this like Super Mario Galaxy feel of, oh we're in space, you get the feel of, oh we're in a generic geometrically constructed Kirby level, right? They could have gone further with the theme and maybe it would have been cool if they did, but as it stands right now it's just nothing impressive really. Comparatively, the Forgotten Lands post-apocalyptic setting is not just visually interesting, it also serves as a good springboard for interesting level designs, like the malls, or mechanics like the mouthful cars or vending machines. Part 6. Why can't I play with my friends? And finally, as one more indictment of Star Allies as a single-player game, one of the big elements of Star Allies is the Dream Friend. It's actually kind of cool that you can play as all these characters from Kirby's past in this game. So explain to me, Nintendo, why I can't do that in normal, standard, single-player story mode on your game. I want to be able to play as King DDD or Marx or Susie, not just in some stripped-down mode. It, it honestly just baffles me. It's one of the headline features of the game, and just flat out you don't get to experience it if you're playing in single-player, which I imagine is a sizable chunk of the audience. And. I mean, I get it, it's Kirby's game, but, like, this would not have been a difficult thing to implement. They're already playable, you just gotta let the player one play as them. Come on! Oh, and, uh, speaking of headline features, I might make some enemies by saying this, but... Applying elemental effects to weapons, while it may have seemed like a cool idea, only served to make the game more repetitive, and makes switching up cop abilities even more useless than I have already mentioned. This is because it makes any of the elemental abilities themselves basically obsolete. Why be fire when you can instead be a fire sword? Look, Game Design 101 here. Letting the player do more things and have more powers is not inherently more interesting than them having fewer. Like, say for example, in theory, you could make a cop ability that warps you to the final boss, and that would be adding a new ability to the player's arsenal. But you'd never do that, because just warping the player to the final boss is inherently uninteresting. Well, you know what, Nintendo? Effectively making half of your copy abilities obsolete is also inherently uninteresting. Like, again, I get it, it was cool, it was maybe even a bit fun, but it was kinda sloppy design. I don't think it really worked out here. And it only served to stress the areas this game was already weak in. Unsurprisingly, I believe that the Forgotten Land handles its modified cop abilities much better. This is for two reasons. First, it takes decent work and effort to earn these modified cop abilities. You don't just happen to get them when you happen to have a fire dude next to you and you happen to already be holding a sword. You gotta go get a scroll, you gotta get some money, you gotta get these gems. It's, it's a whole deal, it's a whole process to do it. So it actually feels earned. And second, upgrading, say for example, sword, doesn't suddenly make another ability like tornado redundant. It makes sword better without infringing on the other cop abilities niches. This is the sort of design that I appreciate and would like to see more of going forward, Nintendo. Final thoughts. So in conclusion, I do actually agree that Kirby and the Forgotten Land is one of the best Kirby games ever released. But curiously, it's not because it's an extremely innovative game that pushes the envelope. Realistically, the reason why Kirby and the Forgotten Land is so good is because it does a superb job of bringing a relatively unchanged Kirby formula 
specifically the one from the 3DS games, into full 3D. Ultimately, it is my firm belief that a successful implementation of linear exploration is a must for any good modern Kirby game. Such design solves a lot of inherent issues you face when designing a Kirby game. How do I incentivize players to make use of a wide variety of copy abilities? Force them to use different ones to get their collectibles. How do I keep players from just flying over my whole levels? Force them to search for things down within the levels. How do I make sure players don't get bored of wave after wave of samey combat? Break it up with puzzle rooms that they actually have an incentive to engage with. Ignore linear exploration at your peril, Nintendo. I do truly believe it is the key to this particular franchise of yours. You may just end up with another Star Allies if you try to throw that design philosophy out again. But anyways guys, do consider subscribing and checking out my other Kirby videos as well as my other game design analyses. Until next time, I have been Simicraft, and I will catch you in the next video. Goodbye.